The passage says, now he was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon came out, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, he drives out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And others, as a test, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. So knowing their thoughts, he, this is talking about Jesus, by the way, he told them, every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say, I drive out demons by Beelzebul, and if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons drive them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. If I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his estate, his possessions are secure. But when one stronger than he attacks and overpowers him, he takes from him all his weapons he trusted in and divides up his plunder. Anyone who is not with me is against me, and anyone who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit comes out of a person that roams through waterless places looking for rest, and not finding rest, it then says, I'll go back to my house that I came from. Returning, it finds the house swept and put in order. And so then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and settle down there. As a result, that person's last condition is worse than the first. As he was saying these things, a woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. But Jesus said, rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is the word of God. Y'all can be seated and ask that you join me for a moment of prayer. And I'll say this is going to be, uh, I won't be before you as long. It's going to be somewhat of a shorter sermon. I just got one single point that I want to make. I want to make that point by preaching from the thought, the forceful and finalizing finger of God. So it won't take as long because I want to make one point with the thought in mind, the forceful and finalizing finger of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you for your victory and the way that your word reveals the way that this victory is taking place. We thank you for sending Christ, who is the ultimate victor over sin, death, and the grave. And we thank you that Christ is not just a victor for himself, but he's also a victor for us. On our behalf, he's conquered death. For our sake, he's ushered in your kingdom. And so now we get to read in your word about that kingdom, about its establishment. And we get to rejoice that through the work of Christ, we're made citizens of it. And so we do this morning, Father, we rejoice in who you are, and in what you've done through the miraculous work of your son. God, I pray and ask that as we take heed to this morning's passage, we leave this place rejoicing all the more. Might we see that your kingdom is the eternal everlasting kingdom. And might we see that once we've been made citizens of this kingdom, that'll never change. So we rejoice in this in tr as truth, Father. And I pray, and I said, as I attempt to, to preach this truth toward the end of hearts being pierced by it, that you would use me toward that end. God, I thank you that my heart has been pierced by this truth. And so I pray that you would help me to preach as a pierced one, sticking to see others be joyfully pierced and respond to the truth of your word. I need your help, God. You know of my human insufficiencies. You know of all of my inadequacies. And so it is my prayer, Father, that you would do what only you can and supernaturally make up for them. I thank you, Lord, for the great privilege to stand before your people. And it is for your glory, with dependence upon your spirit, and in the name of your Son, that I both pray and preach. Amen. Well, the Industrial Revolution was an era of haste and hustle. Uh, businessmen did all they could to stay on top. Aspiring businessmen did all they could to reach the top. And as a result, 
Business and industry boomed and multiplied quickly, quick, quick, more quickly than ever before. It seemed that the goal of every man in America was to invent and in some way commodify uh, some new product that the American people would experience for a first time and then refuse to return to life as it had been before this experience. Uh, some were trying to do this in the automobile industry, some tried in the entertainment industry, others tried in the food industry. And one man by the name of John Pemberton, he was a pharmacist who had an unshakable determination to invent what he would have liked to see, uh, eventually become a mainstream everyday, what he would call a health tonic drink. Well, he never did that, but after devoting his entire life to trying to do so, he did invent what we know today as Coca-Cola. It's one of the most recognizable brands in the world today. And you'd think that even though John Pemberton is no longer around, his family uh, would probably still be experiencing great wealth from this Coca-Cola invention. But that isn't the case, because Pemberton died of stomach cancer uh, before Coca-Cola would, would have the chance to become the highly sought after drink that it eventually grew to be, and that it eventually grew to be shortly after his death. And in a rather shrewd, uh, remarkably cunning move, Pemberton's business partner, who owned a third of the company and knew what he had in his recipe, he tricked Pemberton's widow and their only son into selling the remaining two-thirds to him for a little bit of nothing. Uh, rumor has it that Asa Candler, the business partner, he actually approached Pemberton's widow at his funeral <laughs> to begin his conversation and negotiate the sale of Coca-Cola. He capitalized on the family's grief, and as a result, for only a couple thousand dollars, Asa Candler purchased the Coca-Cola brand that is today worth more than $2 billion. Now, chances are many of you hear that and you feel a sense of indignance, anger, some sympathetic frustration. This is because it's innate to the human makeup for us to recognize how it's wrong to unjustly take and benefit from that which someone else is actually responsible for. And in this morning's narrative, this, this narrative in Luke's gospel, it, it has at its core a reinforcement of that innate understanding. You see, friends, in this narrative, we find a group of spectators uh, witnessing the supernatural, miraculous ministry of Jesus, but instead of accurately assuming that his ministry and power was given from God in heaven, they doubt him, and they assume that he's working on the same team as the devil. They were giving Satan credit for the very work of God. And so Jesus graciously takes time and he corrects their mistaken assumption and, and he explains to them that the eternal power and kingdom of God is easily distinguishable and therefore certainly must be distinguished from the inferior power and kingdom of Satan. You see, friends, God's kingdom must never be mistaken for the kingdom of Satan. God's work must never be mistaken for the work of Satan and God's power must never be mistaken for the power of Satan. But according to this passage before us this morning, God's kingdom and his work and his power, it must always be understood as a superior and eternal kingdom and work and power that the lesser and temporary kingdom work and power of Satan can even come close to touching. You see, friends, this text is tailored to teach us that only Jesus has the power to drive out demons and drive out evil and establish a forever kingdom. And so if we'll take heed to this passage this morning, we'll realize that the kingdom of God has significant good in store for those who rightly discern that Jesus is the one who came to establish it. Christ is the one who came to establish the kingdom of God. It's this simple fact, as a matter of fact, that, that those who doubted him in the passage were misunderstanding. Uh, you see, it says in verse 14 that he drove a demon out of a man and that this exorcism, the, the deliverance from this demon, it was such a miraculous display of power that the crowds were amazed. You see, the demon had, had taken away this man's ability to speak and, and apparently he'd been this way for so long that, that the crowds knew of him as a mute man and so they recognized the magnitude of this miracle whenever they saw him speaking. But the text tells us that some of them Matthew and Mark actually do us a favor when they tell this story. They include that it was the Pharisees and the scribes that verse 15 talks about. But it says that some of them, the, these Pharisees and scribes, they accused Jesus of driving these demons out by the power of another demon. Uh, Bizzable, this, this demon they accuse him of being empowered by. Uh, he's understood to be a false god, uh, a lieutenant among demons. He was thought to be an ally of Satan's and one who had rank within the army of Satan. 
And the people in verse 15 assume that Jesus has driven one demon out by the power of this other demon. And then you got another group in verse 16, and, and they, well, they just ain't quite sure what to think. They see that there's this miracle that's happened, but they got some doubts about how the miracle happened. And so they, instead of accusing him, they start demanding of him, the text says, that he perform another miracle just so their doubts can be overcome. You got these two groups of people they were included in this crowd that, that had just watched Jesus deliver this man from a demon, but instead of rejoicing in their amazement, friends, instead of rejoicing at the clear power of God on display or the clear deliverance that this man is now experiencing, instead of rejoicing over these things, they choose to instead doubt and accuse or doubt and demand. And I think when we read this, we gotta ask ourselves a question. After seeing what they just saw, why would they choose to go these routes instead of just believing that these miracles are happening in the way that Jesus says they're happening? Like, why is it that they couldn't clearly understand the power of God as they were witnessing it? I'll tell you why. It's the same reason we've seen other people be mistaken about God's kingdom and about his, his power at other times in Luke's gospel. It's because they want Jesus to do his work by their rules. You see, Jesus didn't come in the way these Jewish religious elites expected him to, friends. I mean, because of all the, the man-made fluff they'd added to God's word over time, their religious system had formed this expectation for, for what Jesus would be like and, and what the kingdom would be like and how the work of the kingdom would happen and who would benefit from their work. They had formed all these expectations to the point that when Jesus shows up to do said work and to establish said kingdom, it isn't just that they didn't recognize what was happening. It's that they looked at it and and, and for some of them, they thought it looked more like the work of Satan than the work of God. I mean, consider how insulting this is to the God of the universe. And he sends his, his son as a designated savior to work by his spirit as a designated source of power. And the people who are witnessing it say, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not the work of God. Like, that must be the work of Satan. Like, I know the man was just delivered from a demon, but, but somehow evil must be at the root of this. Like, we can't deny that Jesus is doing miraculous stuff so we're just gonna deny that the stuff is happening in the way he says it is. This is the insulting, sinful mentality of blasphemy and it shows just how hard these people's hearts were. Like they're, they're assuming that because he didn't come in the ways they expected and with the methods they expected, then surely he can't be the Messiah who they were expecting. I mean, they probably expected a grand, a kingly kind of royal birth to, to, to kingly kind of people where Jesus was born to an unknown woman, a girl even, who claimed she got pregnant by a virgin, as a virgin and then gave birth to the child in an old born where she had to use a manger as a crib. Not very kingly and royal of a birth story. They probably expected him to have a royal upbringing and, and, and to be raised around prominence. Jesus lived an average lifestyle. He was raised as a carpenter. I mean, surely they expected him to, to be handsome and, and extremely alluring in his appearance. Scripture tells us that he was an average looking man. Then he goes on and he lives a homeless lifestyle. The, then, then the followers that he pursues were, were lowly fishermen. And then the people he spends his time ministering to are tax collectors and prostitutes. There were all these things about Jesus that didn't measure up to their expectations. And so just in case there's anybody in the room this morning who's at a similar place, like just in, in case you're in the room and you yet to trust in Christ because you're looking at what scripture says and you don't see a picture of a God who you want to worship or a savior who you want to follow, just in case you're at that place because the God of the Bible doesn't look like what you expect him to look like, let me tell you something, friends. God hasn't revealed himself through his word and through the gospel message for you to see a God who looks like what you expect him to. You see, God, friends, has, has revealed himself so that those who have soft hearts might see that he's even better than what any of us would have ever expected. And so as long as you're sitting and waiting to, for God to look like what you expect him to look like, you're going to be waiting and waiting and waiting. And just like the people in this passage, you'll be missing out on the opportunity to rejoice at the miraculous work of God that's happening right before your eyes. I mean, think about it. God created us in his image. And therefore, it's, it's, it's a logical thing for us to take these minds that he made and to form expectations that we say he's got to meet or else he isn't God. Mm-mm. It doesn't work like that. You see, this passage, friends, is Luke giving us yet another reminder that the work of God happens, that the plan of God unfolds, that the initiatives of God take place by nobody's agenda and nobody's methodology and nobody's expectations other than God's own. God had sent Jesus to establish the kingdom, but as we see from the people in the passage, 
They're observing this. They're seeing this very establishment. As we, as we see from them, anytime you get your own standard for how God must work, anytime you get that locked too tightly in your mind, your standard can blind you from seeing the work of God actually taking place. And so I pray, friends, I pray that this would not be the case for anybody among us. May we not fail to see the work of God due to the expectations we have for how this work must happen. It's a failure of the group in this passage, and it's this failure that Jesus calls him out for. Verse 17 tells us that he calls him out because he knew their thoughts. So he saw the accusations and, and the demands. He saw those things for what they really were. And so he helps them to kind of put things in the proper perspective. He says, the reason you're failing to understand what's really happening with my miracles is because you're failing to remember that there's two spiritual kingdoms engaged in spiritual warfare. He says, if you kept in mind that there are spiritual battles going on, then you wouldn't have mistook this for me being on the same team as the one who I just defeated when I drove that demon out. And so Jesus says, let me, let me kind of explain this simple truth to you. He says, in any war, if a kingdom starts to fight against itself, that kingdom's headed for destruction. He says it's simple logic, like if houses divide against themselves, then those houses cease to stand. And so it makes no sense for you to say about me that I'm driving out the kingdom of Satan by the power of Satan, because common sense should tell you that Satan wouldn't work against himself to see his own kingdom fall. And then Jesus gets personal. He says, he says since y'all know so much, since y'all, since y'all seem to have all the answers, if I, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, who's Satan's agent, like if I do that, then tell me this. By whom do your sons drive the demons out? These sons who Jesus mentions are probably referring to disciples or, or followers of these religious officials, maybe the Jewish people as a whole. He poses this question because he wasn't the only one who had been driving out demons. Uh, we saw back in chapter 9 in, in the last season of Luke that we did, and then we can see again in Acts chapter 19 that apparently Others have been encountering uh, demon-possessed people that would pray for God to deliver these people, and then God would deliver them. So God was demonstrating his power over demons, even through other people. But those other people weren't being accused of Satanism. It was only Jesus who's being accused of working for the devil by working against the devil. And so Jesus points this out to kind of show them the inconsistency of their own argument. He says, you stand as judged by the work of your own sons. Like your partiality is clear because you don't tell them like when they drive out demons that they work for Satan. Like you're not saying that to them, it seems to be only me who you got a problem with. Friends, Jesus was causing these problems because these Pharisees couldn't control his ministry. I mean, most of the other folks who were casting out demons would have been faithful Jews who faithfully adhered to the Jewish system and faithfully reported to the Jewish authorities. And so when Jesus shows up and he's, he's casting out demons and, and preaching and performing miracles, doing all this divine stuff, but they can't control it all, like they'd rather assume at that point that he's working by the power of Satan than by working for, by the power of God. But so Jesus goes on and he presents what's true. He says, here's a better option. And he tells them what's true in verse 20. He says, if, hypothetically speaking, <laughs> if, it's by the finger of God that I drive out these demons. Then be not mistaken, the kingdom of God actually has come upon you. He says, if I'm out here casting these demons out by the finger of God, then let that be a sign to you that I've come to establish the kingdom of God. The question that this hypothetical if statement would have posed to those who were listening that day is the same question that continues to confront everybody today. Is evil driven out by the finger of God? Is it by the finger of God that evil forever goes away? Or, or could it be some other thing that is at the root of evil being evicted and righteousness being restored? Or must it be the forceful and finalizing finger of God? I took a little research journey this week in an attempt to try to help us to answer this question this morning. I wanted to see where else the finger of God is identified in scripture. And what I found is that there are only two other occasions, both with the same person. It was one of the first saviors who was sent to rescue the people of God. Y'all remember Moses went into Egypt and he says to Pharaoh, he says, hey, you need to let the people of God go. And Pharaoh was like, nah. And so Moses, to show that he was a representative of God's, God gave Moses power to do some miraculous stuff. And then Pharaoh was like, okay, I got something for that. 
He goes and gets these professional magicians from Egypt. They come and he tries to get them to, to imitate the miraculous stuff that Moses was doing. Well, you come to Exodus chapter 8, and even though these magicians had been able to, to do some imitation miracles, their tricks eventually ran out. You see, God starts giving Moses the ability to create life out of nothing. And now since that's something that only God has the power to do, these magicians quickly realize that they, like in trying to compete with Moses, they were out of their league. And so they say to Pharaoh, they're like, look, man, um, there's some stuff that we can fake and like imitate with, with black magic. But this kind of stuff that he's doing, like when he hits the ground and the dust turns into gnats, like, like we can't do that kind of stuff. They said, there's some stuff that we can imitate and, 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 and make up, but the kind of things Moses is doing, catch this, it only happens by the finger of God. You see, the black magic couldn't compare to the finger of God when Moses went to rescue the people out of Egypt. And the power of Satan in this passage can't compare to the finger of God as Jesus is rescuing these people from their sin. Friends, it was no power of Satan at work. It was no power of Beelzebub. It was the finger of God that was at work. This finger that had written a script and paved a path toward redemption was now pointing in the direction of that path. Friends, the kingdom of God has come is what Jesus is saying here. And according to verse 23, he says, you're either with this kingdom or you're against this kingdom. And I just want to tell you all this morning that I hope you choose to be with this kingdom. Friends, Jesus is showing us in this passage that Satan may have wielded power in the lives of people for a time. He may have shown some strength for a time. But as with any other war... When a stronger man shows up, verse 21, to attack and overpower the man who appeared to be strong, when, when this stronger man takes away his weapons and divides up his plunder, the stronger man establishes his way. And so the kingdom of God has come, Jesus says. The kingdom of God is the stronger, more powerful kingdom. And Jesus would later go on to prove that he is indeed the stronger man from the stronger kingdom. I mean, think about it. The greatest weapon that Satan had to wield, Christ has taken from him. Where Satan appeared powerful with death as a weapon, Jesus has shown that he's more powerful by wielding resurrection, friends. The kingdom of God has come is what this passage is showing us. And the kingdom of God hasn't come to, to partner up with the kingdom of evil. It hasn't come to, to be mistaken for the power of Satan. The kingdom of God has come through the work of Christ and by the finger of God. It is forcefully forever with finality driving out the kingdom of evil. That's what the kingdom of God is here doing. Y'all look quiet this morning. I'm going to keep preaching. I trust that the Lord's working in your hearts. Maybe the nods and the silence means that you're contemplating on God's word. But Jesus, he shows us in, in, in verses 24 through 26, the finalizing effect that the kingdom of God has on Satan and his demons. He says that when an unclean spirit, a demon that is, when, when it comes out of a person, it roams through waterless places. That's, that's a metaphor for a dry desert, a place that has no nourishment to sustain his evil spirit. He says it roams through these waterless places looking for rest and not finding rest. It then says, I'll go back to my house that I came from. Returning, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and settle down there. And as a result, that person's last condition is worse than the first. Now, what Jesus does here is he gives a little insight into the way uh, demons and evil spirits operate. Was just as a side note, I think a passage like this one, it should be encouragement enough for us to be wary of things like horror films and Ouija boards, playing with paranormal activity and all that kind of stuff. Like I, I was convicted myself when studying this passage this week because in the past, I've enjoyed a good horror movie, but probably not after this week. You see, friends, this comment from Jesus is enough to show us that evil demonic spirits are real and I just don't think it's wise for us to go in and make light of that and to, to kind of view these very adversaries that want to wreck us spiritually as entertainment or playful ideas for us to tour around with. That stuff is real, and I imagine Satan would be thrilled for us to be so entertained by the idea of it that we kind of put our guards down. We become numb and we stop being aware of this kingdom battle that's going on. That's for free. It's a good word for free. But Jesus in these verses, friends, is showing us the way demons operate. And what he shows us is, is what many of us probably would already assume. A demon's sole purpose, their sole desire, is to counteract the good, life-giving, God-glorifying purposes of Jesus. They want to wreak havoc and destroy and call evil and sin to be present in the lives of God's people. And so they roam relentlessly until they find a place to do this. Now, that's the point Jesus is making here. But in making this statement, he's also implying that there's something that changes when the kingdom of God is ushered in. 
He's implying something about the change that takes place as the kingdom of God comes. I was on the phone with um, Simply Safe this week. We're in the process of getting the building more secure, trying to uh, put all the cameras and, and, and keypads and stuff in the right place. We're going to have a, a security system on the building soon. And so I spent almost two hours talking with the Simply Safe lady, trying to be sure that we're getting the right equipment for our type of facility, uh, that, that everything's going to be in the right place, that it's going to function well, all this stuff, this, that, and the other. So we spent almost two hours talking about cameras and keypads and motion detectors, all this high-tech equipment that will hopefully make our building more secure. And toward the end of the call, after talking about all this high-tech stuff, she reminded me, she said, um, and Pastor Ross, don't forget that on top of all of this, you also get two free yard signs and four free stickers to put in your window. <laughs> and I'm, I'm guessing my excitement or my lack of excitement, my silence, showed her that, that I didn't quite understand what the big deal about this was because at that point, she went on to explain. She said, the reason I remind you of this is because according to research, those signs and stickers actually do deter a lot of criminal activity. She said, home invaders see these signs and they know that these properties are secure, so they avoid these properties that have the signs, and they don't go to them for their invasions. She told me that. I said, oh, okay, I understand what you're saying now, and you also just helped me to preach. Because in this passage, friends, I think Jesus is implying to us that when the kingdom of God comes, an exorcism is not only an emptying of demons, but it's an infilling with a deterrent. You see, unlike when the sons from verse 19 would drive out demons, when Jesus, who, who brings with him the kingdom of God, drives out demons, he puts a stake down that says, you better not come back to this house. You see, when Jesus casts out demons and removes evil, he puts up a seal that says, this property is not to be invaded. This one hasn't just been emptied and cleaned like the one in the passage. No, no, no. This property has been emptied and cleaned and filled with something new. Christians, don't you know? That because your deliverance has been given by Christ, you haven't been left clean and empty, but you've been cleaned and you've been filled with God's Holy Spirit. I think Apostle Paul probably had this in mind when he wrote in Ephesians that the Holy Spirit is a down payment placed upon the people of God. That we've been sealed by him for the day of redemption. Like as Christians, we ain't just, just healed. We're not just redeemed and healed from our sins, but we're healed, we're filled. And we're sealed, beloved. Like the evil, think about this. The evil that was once pervasive in all of our lives has been forever removed by the work of Christ. And so even when it seems that evil still prevails, we must remember that goodness is ours in the end. Even when it seems that Satan is still having his way, we must remember that his greatest weapon has been forever taken. Even when it seems, friends, that we are under the oppression of the devil's wicked hand, we must remember that the righteous finger of God is forever and finally removing the hand of Satan from our lives. Even when it seems that the kingdom of Satan is overtaking us, we must remember that his kingdom is being driven out by the greater kingdom and the stronger man. Christ Jesus has come to establish the kingdom of God. And this church, this means that when the powers of Satan and his demons are removed from your life, they're removed with zero chance of return. You all remember what happened to those demons that Jesus cast out in Matthew chapter 8? They couldn't go back into the man that it had come from, and so they went into some pigs, and over a cliff they went. You all remember what happened to the demons that Jesus cast out in, in Mark chapter 1, or Matthew chapter 8, or Mark chapter 5, or Luke chapter 8, or the 51 other times the Bible mentions Jesus casting out demons? Well, I don't know what happened to them either. But what I can guarantee you is that they didn't go back where they came from. <laughs> Friends, when Jesus casts out demons, he gives deliverance, and the one who's being delivered forever belongs to him. And it never again, they never again belong to Satan, friends. When Christ Jesus delivers you, he makes you a citizen of his kingdom, and it's a citizenship that can never be taken away. And so my encouragement to you today is this. Whatever you're seeking, whatever deliverance you seek, whatever you're seeking deliverance from, if you want it to be permanent, find the deliverance in Jesus. Willpower and pep talks, that might give you temporary relief. Self-help books and podcasts, they might give you temporary relief. Work and school, good deeds, distractions, they might give you temporary relief. Relationships might give you temporary relief. You can even find dark things to give you temporary relief from other dark things. And if you're just looking for a little relief, then maybe these things are what you need. 
But if you want to be forever rescued, if you want to be forever rescued from the domain of darkness, you need to be placed in the kingdom of Christ. Our passage ends with a woman from the crowd. And I think she's meant to contrast the doubters in the crowd. Uh, she was hearing Jesus teach truth. She, she had seen him give deliverance, so she couldn't help herself anymore. She cries out. She says, blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. It's a statement of praise for Jesus. She's so in awe of him that she makes a statement of praise and, and blessing about the one who birthed him. But Jesus doesn't respond by saying amen. And I imagine he was appreciative of the woman's praise. And so he does her a favor and he kind of tunes up and, and, and corrects her praise so that it would be more accurate. He redirects her attention from that of his earthly biological birth to the more important spiritual reality at hand. Essentially, Jesus is making the point that, yeah, Mary, my mother, she may be blessed, but her giving me an earthly birth isn't the primary reason she's blessed. He's making the point that she, along with all others who hear the truth of God's word and then respond to it, they're to be considered blessed. Why is this church? It's because those who hear the word of God and keep it are the ones who are kept in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that deliverance is ours in Christ. That as we hear your word and respond to it, as you give us eyes to see the truth of it, we're forever delivered. And the rule and plans, the ways of Satan have no place in our lives anymore. And so, God, I pray that anybody in the room who's seeking deliverance today, anybody who's looking for deliverance from sin, temptation, evil, whatever it might be, Father, I pray that they would look to Christ, that they would seek your kingdom as the eternal source of deliverance. We pray it all in the name of the one who's made it possible. We pray it in the name of Christ Jesus himself. Amen.